you know, when you find yourselves in situations like these where data has to be collected for, you know, e-discovery matter or corporate investigation, you know, again, ensuring that the evidence is admissible is important. And it's very easy for someone who isn't experienced in forensics to, you know, take a peek at data or, or try and preserve it one way and you know, not do it right. And now they're destroying important evidence and uh, removing important data that is critical for forensic investigations and other types of analysis that needs to be performed. So it's very important to engage in a trusted provider. So we want to talk about what does the forensic team need from the client and what can we provide prior to the engagement to ensure that you know we start off on the right foot and we're going to get the data properly. And so when it is needed in litigation, it's admissible and we've used a defensible process. Yeah, that's a lot to talk about, Joe. So, uh, really, really, it, it comes down to getting access to the data. And when you have the access to the data, who's going to collect it? And like you said, you don't want the typical IT department collecting the data. And most of them haven't been trained in any kind of proper digital forensics. Their focus isn't on getting to the evidence and protecting it, right? It would be kind of akin to, you know, you have a robbery at a local gas station and you need to catch the person because nobody has ever seen this person on video before, but the person didn't have gloves on. They left a fingerprint on the door as they went out the door. Would you want the first people coming on the scene touching that door where that fingerprint is? No, absolutely not, because then you're going to ruin the evidence. Unfortunately, sometimes that happens when other folks, like you said, take a peek and look at the evidence. So engaging a trusted provider is all about finding people who have that skill set that you need. They, the people that are going to know to ask the right questions, like who's taking a look at this? Has anybody touched this? What happened to the device as soon as, say, it's corporate espionage or theft? You know, who touched that device as soon as that person left the building, right? And the forensic analyst that has a good level of experience is going to be able to, to provide that level of knowledge to ask those questions and then to get the right things that they need to move forward to grab that data. So things like the account credentials, right? We're going to need that to get into a network. We're going to need that to get access to the, the data. We're going to need passcode. If somebody's providing an iPhone, that's becoming a huge thing for us because if people are more concerned about their privacy, they may do something like encrypt their iTunes backup, in which case now we need two passcodes. That sort of information is things that an experienced forensic analyst is going to know about. From the side for the client, you know, they can provide us the custodian contact information, help us schedule things out. It's a communication process that goes back and forth between the forensic analyst and the client, right? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to explain something that's highly technical and bring it down to just our average knowledge base, right? So we're trying to set good expectations of what the client can expect and what can we actually get versus what they've seen on CSI. We follow those with the explanations of what's going on because nobody wants to be left in the dark about, hey, is that company getting my data correctly? Uh, I haven't heard anything from them in a while. Those type of questions, you know, a good leading industry forensic analysis who's got lots of experience, they're not going to make those type of little mistakes, right? And then the all important one here is we can do all this work, but if you don't have good documentation, if the analyst isn't taking a little bit of notes here and there, if they're not documenting what they do, at the end of it, how is that person going to turn over the information to the client so that they can actually do something actionable with it? That, that To me, that's a definitely a big thing that could trip a, a legal investigation up or, or a project up. So basically, it all boils down to just a few things that are important for clients. Did the forensic analyst do something and get the information, the evidence, in a way that's repeatable, reproducible, and defensible in court? And each one of those is, you could think of it as like a little triangle. If one of those legs is missing, it's all going to collapse. And so oftentimes, if a forensic analyst has been hired 
to help an organization out, you want to make sure that if the opposing side provides their own specialist, that the information that's located and provided by your forensic analyst is going to match what the other folks find. And so being repeatable, reproducible, those things right there help you be able to maintain a defense that the data that you have is the data that you say it is and that it represents what you say it represents. Other things that would definitely be a consideration, things that you want to ask a trusted advisor, something like, hey, do you have a chain of custody? But how do you guys maintain that? What does that look like? What kind of forensic images are you putting all this data into? Are you using just a zip file or are you using something like a EO1 image that's industry known, right? And then the other part of it is after you gathered all this data, how do you know that the data hadn't changed while you grabbed it? And so you would expect that a forensic analyst that's worth their salt is going to say something like, well, yeah, we used, utilized a tool that hashed all the information while we were collecting it. We conducted a verification hash at the end of it. And so we know that the data that we collected is a perfect representation of the data that was collected. And Mike, can you explain what a hash value is and how that's useful, how it's generated and its important role in forensics? You know, Joe, that's a good question. I, I kind of skipped over that, didn't I? So a hash is a numerical representation of a file. And basically, no two files have the same hash. And so uh, you think of it as a fingerprint. That's another good analogy here, is that every file, every unique file has a fingerprint, and all those fingerprints will be unique. The only time that they'll match is when they're an exact copy of each other. And so that is how forensic analysts can take a piece of data from one place, put it into their container. You know, they're going to check that fingerprint before they put it in that container. Then after they get it into that container, they're going to check that fingerprint again. As long as they match, we are good to go and move on with our project. If they don't match, and this does happen from time to time, and you need a good forensic analyst that's going to go back and verify that their data is what they think it is, these are the little things that make the difference between somebody who's just jumped into this type of work versus somebody who's been at it for a while. That's a good explanation. Thanks, Mike.